Hello fellow scale modelers, my name's Tom Pierce and this is The Scale Nerd. So this is the fourth and final video in our series on the aftermath. The aftermath is this little project right here. This is a 135th scale uh, small diorama slash vignette with 10 figures in it. Uh, we have Germans and Americans. This is a German machine gun nest that's been overrun by the Americans. So we've got several wounded and uh, dead Germans in here. Uh, we've got some U.S. paratroopers down in here and some other U.S. infantry and officers up here. So we've got characters that were uh, come from mini art. Uh, we've got four up here on the top that are from Alpine miniatures. Very, very good miniatures. Uh, some of the best in the world come from Alpine. So in the first video that we did in this series, we covered the fabrication and manufacturing of the base, the actual uh, terrain. The second video, we went into uh, the Germans in the scene and their equipment and their weapons and things like that. The third video, we started into the Americans. We got a couple, it's a short video, we got a couple Americans from Mini Art down in there and some final uh, touches to, to wrap up the terrain and the, and the scene down in the nest. And now this fourth and final video, we're going to finish it up with the four American characters from Alpine Miniatures. So really, really nice figures. Uh, we'll be doing that and then just the final, final, final last touches to the diorama to top it off and then of course the unveiling of the finished project. So I hope you watched the first three. If you didn't go back and get caught up on them, but here we go. We're going into the fourth video and final video in the Aftermath series. Okay, our Alpine figures each come with two different heads. So one head has the uh, camo, camo net on it and the other one does not. So you get to pick whichever one you want to use. This one figure I'm using here actually has a cigarette in his mouth. Unfortunately, somehow I broke the cigarette off. Very fragile. So as you can see here, I had to take some sprue, heat it up, melt it, and stretch it out to make another cigarette and glue it in position. Very tedious and difficult process. So I encourage you to be very careful if you've got one of these resin figures with the uh, cigarette in it. They're, they're quite fragile. So we'll go on ahead and start assembling the figures and cleaning up the seams and moving forward from there. To fill the seams, I use different types of epoxy putty. In this case, I'm using a product from Army Painter called Green Putty. So you mix the blue and yellow component, A and B components together to uh, get a green epoxy putty that you can fill in the seams. Next, I go ahead and prime everything up and get it ready to paint. several different ways of base coating uh, your figures. You can do them by hand as I'm doing here, or you can use the airbrush. I prefer to go ahead in most cases and hand brush it on, unless the majority of the figures all one color, in which case I'll typically airbrush, but we've got multiple different colors. So as, rather than try to mask all these off, I just go ahead and hand brush them on. Just wanna make sure you don't put the paint on too thick. So uh, keep it uh, thinned down sufficiently and do it in a couple thin coats. Most of 
most of my detail and shading work is done using a wet palette, but as you can see here, I'm using a stainless steel palette, which I like for mixing large amounts of color, uh, and the stainless steel makes it easy to clean up without staining of the palette. But uh, I only use this palette when I'm doing large areas of coverage with a lot of paint. And uh, so now we've got all the figures base coated and pretty much ready to move to the next step. So here you see me moving on to the wet palette. Um, these everlasting wet palettes from Redgrass Games are fantastic. They allow you to mix much smaller amounts of paint and keep that paint moist for long periods of time. So we go ahead and start begin start the process of shading and adding some shadows in. So I'm mixing the base color with um, either a darker German black brown or a true black to start getting some darker shades. And I usually add a little bit of retarder medium to keep the paint from drying in the brush too quickly and go through and start using very thin down coverage to start building the shadows up in layers. This is really more of a roughed in shading process. Uh, I'm not into the blending and detailing yet. The same process is followed for the highlighting. Working from the mid-tone base color, I start adding a little bit of ivory white to it to gradually start uh, layering my way up to the to brighter shades and create the highlighted three-dimensional effect. cases I like to take a wash color to glaze over the entire um, area after I do my shading. This allows me to shift the color a little bit if need be to increase the saturation or decrease the saturation as well as it goes a long ways in helping to soften the blending and begin the blending process because the thin layer can uh, hide some of the transitions from one shade to another. Using darker shades and lighter shades to go in and highlight all the seams goes a long ways to the creating believability in the figure. You really want to make sure that you are, are very careful to go in and use the dark shades to uh, create high contrast shadows around each individual seam as well as go back in with lighter colors and hit the highlights of the seam and bring, bring them all to life and, and it really uh, makes the figure look believable. The boots were all base coated in a dark chocolate brown. I then go back in and highlight uh, the main raised surface areas with mahogany brown. Uh, it's a closer to the true color of the boot. But as I go through and uh, do that highlighting and shading and then work my way down to the shoelaces, it really starts bringing these boots to life. all completed 
We go in and start working on the jackets and the belts, harnesses, the web gear, and all of those accessories. By making sure that I base coated all of the areas first and in a medium to dark tone and then go through and apply the shadows next, I ensure that I've gotten down into all the little nooks and crannies and crevices uh, throughout the sculpt and the accessories so that I don't get deeply into the shading and finishing process and find a bunch of little tiny white gaps or open spots in the paint that I have to go back and try to fill in and touch in later. So this is uh, pretty much the process I use in all of them. As you can see here, I'm going back in and making sure that I'm bringing high contrast level into all of the uh, seams while I try to keep soft blends on the folds and the other areas of the jacket. I rarely, if ever, use any metallic paints, so you want to make sure that when you're doing things like bullets and guns and so forth, that you try to avoid the metallic paints. Here are the uh, colors that I use for my weapons, so various different colors of brown and orange to do the wood grain, and then your black, blue, and white to create your non-metallic metal effect for all the metallic areas of the gun. So I tried to use different types of wood for each one of the uh, weapons in, in these figures, reproducing different colors and different grain patterns to simulate the different types of wood. And again, making sure that I'm not actually using any metallic content in my paint for the metal areas, but using um, just standard paints to reproduce the highlights and reflections and, and so forth to make the, the metal look real. Now, these guns did not come with any type of sling or strap to them, so uh, I needed to make those from scratch. So in this case, I'm doing it from masking tape by folding it over and cutting strips and then painting it up to make uh, a, a decent little gun sling for this figure. Uh, for the BAR rifle, um, I didn't have a gun sling on it, and then you'll see uh, I'm going to use electrical tape for the gun sling on one of the other rifles. So working very carefully here, I'm trying to put a different type of wood grain pattern here that draws attention to the concave uh, dimensional effect in this specific uh, portion of the stock. Now sometimes when I do the uh, wood grain. I'll coat the entire wood area with the retarder medium so that as I go in to apply the wood grain I can use a very slight amount of paint on a very thin brush and it just glides and slides through there to help me make long continuous uh, straight lines of wood grain without the paint drying in the tip or the, the color skipping across the, the surface area. And I try to make sure that the wood grain follows the shape of the wood so that you get a little bit more believable effect to that pattern.
going back to the BAR, you can see I'm trying to create some sort of a non-metallic metal effect. So you want to create dark and light areas uh, with a lot of light areas around the uh, edges and details so that you can uh, simulate reflection of light and uh, shadow area from the ground and the areas around it. Uh, makes a much more believable uh, metallic effect than just using slapping a metallic paint on there. So now I'm fixing all the rifles to the figures. And here we're going to go ahead and do the other gun sling using uh, electrical tape this time. So again, folding it over to itself, cut strips, uh, bend the ends over, glue them together, and then sculpt some little attachments, uh, buckles and, and rings to go on it. And obviously painting it and attaching it to the rifle. Now moving on to the helmet, we get the base coating done, and then we start uh, doing some shading here. So I. I start with a slightly lightened color of the helmet base color and use a dry brush to just slightly buff the highest areas of the helmet to bring a little bit of contour, the round contour to it. And then move on to uh, using some enamels to wash it uh, for the recessed areas and create some shadow around the, around the bottom and the rim, uh, create details. Then I do some little spots around it to dirty it up and distress it and get a little weathering with some various different enamels from AK. Then go back with some pure thinner and dilute those marks to try to wash them into the helmet. And then a few other minor little fleck and speck details. Uh, then we move on to the straps. Similar process for the helmet with the camo netting, but it's done mostly with the dry brush to create uh, the relief. And then, of course, adding the officer's markings to, to the figure's helmets. Now, I've often been asked what brushes that I use. These are the most common brushes I use for painting the figures. Uh, I've tried this one a few times, this insane detail brush from Army Painter. Uh, it's not bad, it does a pretty good job, but um, I typically like these here, the, the 2030 and 50 brushes from Transon. Very inexpensive. Uh, they come in uh, two of each of the size in a pack, and they hold their shape for a very long time, and for the price, you just can't beat them. I really like these brushes. Uh, most of the detail work is done with the 30 and 50. Uh, I start the heads by base coating with mahogany brown and then use a little bit of darker brown to go in up around the helmet area. Then go back in, uh, roughly shape in the eyes with a light gray, never use white or you, or you will get very unbelievable glaring, staring eyes. Then we go in and add the iris color, the blue or the brown, whatever color you're gonna use, followed by a very small dot of a black pupil. Now this will kind of exceed the perimeter of the eye shape, so you go back with the mahogany brown and re-outline the mahogany brown to clean up the shape of the eyes. Uh, sometimes I'll go in here and just under the eyebrow, add a little bit darker shading under there. Once that's done, I start working my way back up to the base flesh tone by using very thin down layers, probably 90, 95% water, uh, with a little a retarder medium to uh, glaze my way up to what I would consider to be the medium base tone of the flesh. Uh, trying to stay away from the darkest areas, but I can layer this on such that uh, I put less layers in some areas and more layers in other areas so I can kind of retain 
a little bit more shading from the mahogany brown wherever I need to. But I'm really just trying to get a background color here to start adding the real shading. Here we've got all the heads prepped with the eyes done and the, and the primary colors down. And so we go in and start adding a little bit of color and shading to start defining uh, the character of the face. I'm using mostly chocolate brown and mahogany brown mixed in with my base flesh tone, diluting it at about 90%, putting a little bit of retarder medium in there and just kind of working my way through my layers. I do the same thing with uh, some ivory white and the base color to work my way up through the highlight areas. And again, you gotta be really patient and work slowly with very thin down layers. And remember that these colors look very bright when they're wet. And then as they dry, especially since most of it's water as they dry, they almost disappear. They get very, uh, they get darker and very transparent. So you just kind of repeat the step over and over again, let it dry to see where you stand and uh, work your way all the way up to the brightest highlights. Now to begin blending, I use a stippling technique of very thin down paint to go in and just dot my way around to start blending in the shading to the highlighting. And then I add a little bit of color, usually a rosy red color, very, very thin to the cheeks to start bringing some life to his face. Then I'll take a thin down gray color to start adding somewhat of a five o'clock shadow. Make sure that any highlighting you do after that in the, in the beard area is done in grays and no flesh tone in it. So with the head done, I can go ahead and fix it to the body and this figure is complete. Moving on to the next figure, I repeat the same process for this head and get it installed and so on and so forth until all the figures are done.
once I've got all these figures done, I'm gonna create a nameplate. So I take some inkjet water slide paper. So I actually print out the nameplate on um, my inkjet printer, spray it with clear lacquer, let it dry, soak it in water, attach it to a little brass plate. Then I'm gluing that to a piece of styrene that I've painted olive drab coat that with clear acrylic. Then glue it to the diorama, glue in all the figures in place, and we're done. So here we have it, the finished project. Okay guys, there you go. We're all finished up with the aftermath. This 135th scale project is finally complete. It took me a good deal of time to work this one out, but it's done and I think it's worth it. it turned out really well. So I hope you enjoyed the video, picked up something new that uh, might help you out in your further projects. And again, I, I encourage you to go back and watch the first three videos if you haven't and see uh, if there's anything there that's of any use to you. Uh, also come visit me on Facebook, The Scale Nerd at Facebook, as well as uh, my YouTube channel, The Scale Nerd YouTube channel. I've got a lot of photos and videos of my projects as I work on them and as I finish them, I post up on those two channels uh, to share with uh, the community and hopefully help others with it. So give me some likes, shares, and follows and, uh, and support my channels as I continue to try to put out more additional content. So once again, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was kind of long, but I think it was, it was worth it. There was a lot of content to cover. And until the next time, guys, safe and happy modeling. Bye now.